Once again, we do apologize for the delay this morning. We clearly know that anytime we're dealing with technology, there's always the possibility of having glitches here and there. So we do ask your, beg your pardon this morning and forgive us for the delay of our time. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 20, uh, just part of our devotional reading for this morning. Uh, as we get ready again to give God the praise and honor and glory that he so rightfully deserves. He has been so wonderful to us these last 168 hours. And here we are again today with the opportunity to worship him, to praise him, to sing songs, to pray together, to read the scriptures together, to be able again to share what the band is going to lead us in, in, in singing praises to our God. So I pray that you are set to do that this morning. Your heart are lifted to God, and right now you won't have any distractions. You're not trying to cook and worship. You're not trying to clean and worship. You're not trying to think about anything else about tomorrow and worship because God right now deserves our full, total, undivided attention. Amen. Second Kings chapter 20, verse 1, 2, and 3, just for our hearing today. It says, in those days Hezekiah was sick and near death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Notice again what the word says. It was in the days of Hezekiah he became sick. What we do know today that we are living in a time that many, many people we know are getting sick. And we do know we've got this invisible enemy that uh, has been referred to as the coronavirus or COVID-19. And the reality for us, all of us, James would remind us in the word, that life is like a vapor. And any day at any moment, all of us could be gone. That's just the reality. But we are more in a prevalent time now where we recognize that our lives are in the Lord's hands. Death is all around us, and it seems to be um, um, uh, increasing more and more as we get the reports and the like. But regardless to whether it's the coronavirus or whether it's the situation that Hezekiah had where he became sick and was about to die, regardless of that situation, all of our lives ought to be a time where we're all getting our house in order that we're all setting things in order. So it doesn't matter who we are, God would say to us, set your house in order. If you're a man, if you're a woman, if you're a young man, a young lady, if you're a, a, a lady, a, a young lady, a boy, a girl, doesn't matter who you are, God would say set your house in order. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether you have a job, don't have a job, it doesn't matter again uh, whether you're young or whether you're old, he would say set your house in order, you may be a, a, a married, you may be single, but God would say, set your house in order for you shall. At some point, we know that is a reality for us. But notice what the Bible says, that because of Hezekiah's relationship to God, he could go to God and pray. And he talks to God. He, 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 he asks God, if you would, very real sense, uh, bringing about the, the fact that he had a loyal heart toward God. And I always love that. I'm just wondering, folk, in this pandemic, are we, are you and I staying loyal to the Lord? Are you and I uh, being more loyal to the Lord than we are to the government? Are you and I being more loyal to the Lord than we are to our jobs? Uh, are you and I being more loyal to the Lord than we are maybe to our husband and our wife? Are you and I being as loyal to the Lord as we ought to be? Because God wants our undivided attention. God had Hezekiah's attention then, and God is again, has our attention, and he's saying to each and every one of us, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. We don't know. We don't know what the Lord has for us today. But here is what we do today. We know that today is the day of worship. Today is the day of praise. Today is the day that we come corporately together to give him what he deserves. So let's make sure today that our hearts are loyal to him, that we will not be distracted. We will not be divided. We will not in any way be thinking of anything else 
for these next few hours other than the fact that God deserves our undivided attention. Father, how we love you, how we thank you, how we bless you, and how we praise you. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us another chance just to be able to worship you in a spirit of beauty, spirit of holiness, a spirit of power, a spirit of recognition again that you're God and you're God alone. The fact that you don't need us to help you to do anything. You don't need us to aid you in doing anything. You don't need our advice. You don't need our counsel. That whatever you do, it's always absolutely positively without the shadow of a doubt. The best thing that could ever be done. And so God, we thank you that today we've been able to wake up to a new day. It's a new chance. It's a new opportunity. We have experienced your grace all night long. All day long, the angels just kept watching over us. And we are so grateful and thankful for that blessing. Now, Lord, the fact that we have awakened to a new day, the fact that you've allowed us to wake up this morning, we're going to give you the praise, the honor, and the recognition that you deserve. We're not going to hold anything back, whether we're in our living room, whether we're in our uh, in, in the building that we call the church building, wherever we may be, in our car, wherever it is, God, we want to give you everything we have because we recognize that there's no promise of, la of after a while. There's no promise of tomorrow. The reality is that all we got is right now. So thank you, Lord, for helping us to give you praise and honor and glory. And we pray that you will receive our service of worship even now. It's in Christ's name. We pray these things. We ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. So wherever you may be right now, just, just stand with us, enjoy it with us. Uh, our children are reminded that God has what the whole world in his hand. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Would you help us now as we 
engage another song again of the church, one of the spiritual songs of our church. Judy Ferdinand is going to lead us at this time. Time is filled with swift transition. None on earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. And hold to God's unchanging hand. Changing hand, oh, 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 to his hands. God's unchanging hands. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Changing hand, oh, hold to his hand. God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Changing hand, oh, 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 to his hand. Come on, sing it now. God's a changing hand. Oh, build your hopes on things eternal, and hold to God's a changing hand. Come on, wherever you are, give him a hand praise. Give him a hand praise right now. Because he is absolutely worthy. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Down at the cross where, where my Savior, Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. To my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Oh, singing glory to His name. Precious name. Precious. 
bottom line is God is showing us that the glory belongs to him. Sean Aguilar is going to be leading us in the word of God. So let's just pause right now. Wherever we are, if you can touch your family, hold their hands. Because listen, folk, we are, we are in a desperate time. We are in a difficult time. Not, not desperate from the standpoint of not knowing what to do. But we're desperate because this invisible enemy we have no control over. We, we can't do anything with it. God has made a determination. God is allowing what's going on to be happening. He has his reasons. It could be his judgment. It could be, again, to get our attention. It could be that he's purging some things. We don't, we don't really know absolutely positively what he's doing. But the one thing we do know is that God knows how to get the glory for himself. And so that's all we just say. Glory to your name, Lord. Glory, glory to your name. Father, how we love you. How we bless you. How we honor you and praise you for demonstrating to us that the glory does belong to you and not to us. Father, I pray right now. And you would help us who are believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ not to be deterred, not to be in any way befuddled by what's taking place in our world. But that we would always know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you control all things. And you have the ability to cause all things to work together for our good. For those of us who love you, you said, and those of us who are called according to your purpose. So now, Lord, the fact that we are here today, we are mindful of so many of our brothers and sisters that even if we were in this building right now, from the north, the south, the east, the west, all of us gathered just as, as we did January, February, the first part of March, if we were all here right now, some of our members would not be here because of circumstances, situations, and the pains of life. So we always remember Sister Almira Ellison, Brother Dave Callahan. God, you know their situations, their circumstances a whole lot better than we could ever understand it. And God, we thank you for taking care of Aunt May and Sister RV and Sister Addison, Sister Paul. Thank you for taking care of Lee Williams and his family. Thank you for watching over Sister Phil and her family. Sister Chandler, Brother Ardwan, all of our elders, God, you know about them. And then you know even the baby that's in Tanisha's belly. God, we ask in Jesus' name that you would help us as a church to focus on the fact that you are God and you're God alone. And we owe you everything. We owe you our life. We owe you our ability to think. We owe it to you, Lord, because if you, if you didn't wake us up this morning, we, we, would, we would again be a talk. We would again be a conversation. But the fact that you allowed us another chance, we're here to say thank you. Then, Lord, even as I pray, to remember the family of Christine Henry, Sharon, Sister Chandler, 
God, we, we pray for the family of Sister G, Pastor G and his family, for the family of Reverend Pastor Arthur Young, his church family, his family. We pray, God, that you continue to be in their hearts. Pray for the family of Jeffrey Edwards, that's Rose's uncle that passed away. We ask again for comfort for those families. As only you can give, Lord. Some things COVID-19 related, other things got nothing to do with it at all. But God, we, we mourn with them because they mourn on this day. And so we ask in Jesus' name that you would comfort hearts, give peace where peace is needed. Help us to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that all things work together because you got it under control. And so now, Lord, we need to hear a word from you again. Speak to Sean. Speak through Reverend Aguilar and allow him to say what you want to be said to our hearts so that we can continue to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise that belongs only to you alone. Speak now, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you receive this morning our preacher for the hour that God will allow us to hear a word from the Lord? Reverend Sean Aguilar, as he leads us to the throne of grace in the word of God. Amen. Amen. The prayers have been prayed. I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ as a sinner that is saved by grace and a saint that is awaiting the return of our risen Savior. I want to give uh, all honor to God and respect to Pastor Skinner, who has been so generous to grant this opportunity to share with you my convictions about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Pastor Skinner, if you already tuned in with us, talked about Hezekiah and his loyal heart. And it's nice whenever we can talk about the times that we were loyal to the Lord and we praise God for those times in our life, but what about the times that we are disloyal? You know, I've seen um, uh, some of these shows on television, on Netflix, and they show these cars that have been abandoned and uh, forsaken. They're, they're rusted out. They're busted up. And their owners, their previous owners, uh, didn't have any loyalty to them. And uh, it's interesting to see these vehicle restoration shows where they take this bucket of bolts, something that's been left in a barn, something that's been uh, involved in a terrible accident, but somehow, some way, by the end of the show, yeah. it's this shiny, high-performance, well-appointed machine yeah, yeah. that has now been made fit for the road again. Yes, There's a different type of restoration that is available for those of us that are believers in Jesus Christ, but at some point, we got involved in some type of physical or spiritual accident. At some point, our soul rusted over, or at some point, uh, something happened where there was an accident on, our, uh, on the Carfax of our soul. But there is divine restoration available. To find out how, turn with me to the gospel according to John the gospel according to John. 
And when you get to the gospel, according to John, I want you to go to the very last chapter, chapter 21. If you hit Acts of the Apostles, you've gone too far, back up just a little bit. John chapter 21, and we will commence from verse 15, and we will conclude in verse 23. I want to read it for your hearing out of the New King James Version. So again, turn with me, or if you're using a digital copy of the Word of God, scroll with me to John chapter 21, and again, we will commence at verse 15 and conclude at verse 23. It reads on this fashion. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He, being Jesus, said to him, Again, a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out amongst the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? If you would allow just for the time that we have appointed together to think from the thought divine restoration. Divine restoration. You may be seated in the presence of of the Lord. Peter, Peter, we all see so much of ourselves in Peter. Peter, in some ways, is the action hero of the Gospels. If you were going to make an action movie uh, about one of the apostles, you would probably want to focus on Peter. Uh, Peter got himself into a position where Uh, when he was pressed about a matter he didn't want to talk about, he might cuss you out. If you uh, came at him the wrong way, he might cut your ear off. And so Peter, we find ourselves here uh, looking at this uh, motion picture with the Messiah, and he is uh, being held into a conversation in public with the presence of other apostles And Jesus is asking him some very pointed questions. Well, well, we got to look backward before we can look forward. How did we get to this particular point in the gospel? Well, Peter had, as we as we know, denied Jesus three times uh, before he was crucified. And there was a a fellowship that was broken at that moment when Peter denied Jesus Christ. However, Jesus would go on to be crucified, but he would uh, rise after he was crucified, and then he would show himself to the apostles and other brethren. And so 
on one of these occasions because it just, it just was not one time. Uh, but this is after the third time that Jesus, post-resurrection, had shown himself uh, to Peter and some of the other apostles. And so Peter, if you look a little farther up at uh, chapter 21, we see that in this post-resurrection appearance, Jesus showed himself to the apostles, and Simon Peter is found going fishing. He's taking the other apostles fishing, and uh, after this fishing expedition, they get some heavenly advice to guide their human action, and they realize uh, that the, the apostle John realizes and points out to the apostle Peter that this man on the beach is the Lord. So Peter, being the action hero, even though John is the first to understand that it is Jesus at work in their lives, it is Peter that is the first to act. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Peter jumps out of the boat and swims to the shore, leaving the disciples to bring in the catch of the day. And once they come up to land, they find Jesus cooking breakfast on the beach. And you know it had to be the best breakfast ever because the way Jesus cooks breakfast is just breakfast. Yeah, yeah. And so he has this breakfast that's prepared. And now there is a conversation that has to be started because you got to take into account that up to this point in the Gospels, Nothing has been said about how Peter denied and deserted Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but if I'm in a tight spot and I look around and I can't find a friend in sight, if I see you again, we're going to talk about what happened. And there has to be something that's dealt with whenever there's a transgression as great as this. But you see, Jesus does not uh, come to Peter angrily. He does not uh, uh, bring up the past, bring up old things and say, well, where were you and what happened here? And do you know what position you left me in? None of that. But while he's cooking breakfast with the presence of the other disciples, Jesus decides to speak to Peter. And there's Three things that need to happen in order for Jesus to get across to Peter what he needs. Because Jesus wants to change Peter's profession. See, Peter was a fisherman. And as soon as he was left to his own devices, he went back to what he knew best. He went back to, in the natural world, what he was trained to do and what he had confidence in. And so Jesus, seeing this, he sees an opportunity that I need to change Peter's profession because I want him to go from being a fisherman to being a shepherd. Oh, but there's a three-step process in divine restoration. And the first thing that needs to happen, if Jesus is going to change Peter's profession, yes. first he has to change his confession. Yes. So in verse 15, we see that when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? So Jesus, in order to change his confession, he has to first get Peter to look upward. He has to get Peter to look upward. What do I mean by that? Well, here's the deal. Simon Peter had three names. His Jewish name was Simon, but then he was renamed Cephas, which is translated Peter. So Simon is the name that he used from his old nature, from how he was physically born. And so instead of calling him Peter, which is the name that he called him after he changed his name to Cephas, which is translated Peter, now he addresses Simon at the Sea of Galilee where they first met each other. So he takes him back 
to where they first started in ministry together and asks him this question. He addresses him by his old nature, Simon Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now, he may have been referring to these in terms of the catch of fish. He may have been asking, do you love me more than these, referring to the other apostles. But regardless of the fact, either way, there cannot be any person, place, or thing, any noun that we love above Jesus Christ. So Jesus is asking him, do you love me more than these? And he being Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, in the English, that doesn't really, that doesn't really come across as very strange. In the English, it just says, Jesus asked Peter, Simon Peter, do you love me? And Peter responds in kind, saying, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. However, when we look into the Greek words that are used, there are four different words for love in the Greek language. And so there's a, a word for love that is storgy. This is a familial love. There is eros, which is a romantic love, the love between a husband and a wife. But between Jesus and Peter, there are two different loves that are at play, and Jesus uses one word, but Peter uses another. So Jesus says, uh, Simon Peter Son of Jonah, do you love me? And he uses the word agapao, which means the supreme, divine, unconditional love. The love that we always want to receive, but that is so difficult to give out. But Simon Peter responds, and again, in English, it looks like, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. However, Peter responds with a different version of love, a different word, and he uses the term phileo. This is a brotherly love or a love of admiration. And so there's two different levels of love that we see going on here because Jesus is saying that I love you, Peter, Simon Peter, unconditionally divinely, supremely, do you love me in this way? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you, but I love you in this way. And so Jesus does not rebuke him, but he gives him a command to feed my lambs. So we see an examination, an explanation, and then an exhortation. So we have Jesus is examining Peter, his character, and then Peter tries to explain himself to Christ. And then there's an exhortation from Jesus. And so what's trying to uh, be done here is a change of confession. And this gets repeated two more times. He said to him a second time, Simon... This time, he does not say Peter. So now I address you first as Simon Peter, meaning the name that you had and the name that I gave you. But now that you, the way you responded to me, we need to dig a little deeper. So now he says, Simon, son of Jonah. Because right now, you're not acting like Peter. The name that I gave you. So let me just address... Let me drop the letters off the front and the back of your name. Let me take out the doctor and let me take off the MED and the PhD and the MDivs and let me take all the letters off your name. And let's just go back to your God-given name, Simon. Son of Jonah, do you love me? And again, Jesus uses the word agapao and, 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 and Peter Again, responds in kind, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, phileo. So he gives his explanation, and then Jesus again says, tend my sheep. So again, he's trying to give him a new profession. But here at the third time, he says, being Jesus, 
Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And you know, we make a lot of mistakes. And sometimes we don't get it right the first time. And sometimes even our second attempt doesn't work. But on this third attempt, Jesus gets through to Simon. And it says before he answers, Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? So at this moment, at this moment, Peter had to align his thoughts with the three times that he denied Jesus Christ. And that even though he denied Jesus Christ three times, and even in this moment he had not met Jesus' standard of love twice, he realizes how bankrupt he is before a holy God, and he's grieved. And he realizes, you know, I can't, I can't fake it till I make it anymore. I'm going to have to level with Jesus and understand this is all going on in public. There's six other disciples that are, that are around for this conversation. And so now Peter changes his answer on the third try. He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus still says to him, gives him the exhortation, the command, feed my sheep. And see, the secret of feeding sheep, according to Dr. John Lennox, the secret of feeding sheep is a love for the Lord. The secret to feeding sheep is a love for the Lord. And here's the deal. If you're going to be in any type of leadership position, If you're going to lead men and women, if you're going to lead boys and girls, the first thing that you must take care of is have the upward relationship with God correct that you love the Lord. Because everything else that we do is out of an awareness of God and an engagement with God and an outpouring of that relationship. So Jesus again tells him, feed my sheep. So he didn't give up on Peter just because he messed up in the past. And he didn't give up on Peter even though he wasn't quite meeting the standard that he had set for his new assignment. But Jesus still loves Peter enough that if this is the highest that you can come up, then I will meet you where you are right now and enable you to execute on the exhortation of feed my lambs, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep. So not only is there the upward call of God awareness and God engagement where Peter has a change of confession, But also, as we look at verse 18, there must be a change in procession. Verses 18 and 19 read it on this fashion. Most assuredly, Jesus speaking to Simon Peter, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Here's the deal. If we are going to be divinely restored, number one, we have to have a change in our confession. Meaning what we believe about God has to be aligned, but also what we believe about ourselves and how we walk out through life must be changed as well. There must be a change in our procession. So this is moving from the upward call. This is now the inward call. This is a call of self-awareness and self-engagement because Jesus needs to give Peter a preview of coming attractions in order for him to be properly prepared for ministry that will come at hand. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. 
And most of us have that same testimony that when we were younger, we went where we wanted to go. As soon as we had a mode of transportation that would carry us with the, the freedom that we thought we had away from parental control and supervision, we went around and girded ourselves and walked where we wished. And a lot of us got into some of those accidents and damage because we walked where we wished. But at some point, the Christian has to realize that we are not our own, but we are bought with a price. And as you mature, you'll realize that when you get old, things are going to change because you have responsibilities that you realize need to be taken care of. In Peter's case, he says, when you are old, meaning way down the line, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. We all have a destiny to be revealed. We all have a destiny to be revealed. And in this particular case with Peter, because he was given such a great and grand assignment in order to glorify God, he would glorify God in a particular manner of death. When it says you will stretch out your hands, that was a euphemism. That was a, a polite way to say that you're going to be crucified because if your hands are stretched all the way out, then you're in the position to be crucified. And so this was said so that Peter would know how he would die. Now, it, the reason it's important for Peter to know how he's going to die is because he's going to have multiple near-death experiences. And because he knows his end from the beginning, he knows that when they have the midnight prayer service, he can sleep soundly because he knows this ain't it. He knows that when I'm old, I'll be crucified. And when you know the end from the beginning, then you can get through everything in the middle. And so Peter... His procession is changed, his entire walk, not just here on the beach, but all the way throughout his life and ministry. And that was because Jesus had already told him his end from this beginning. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. Now notice this, it's not follow John, it's not follow James, it's not follow someone else that will to be to come, or anything like that. He gets Peter focused, you follow me. There's only one person to follow in the Christian life, and that is Jesus Christ. You might follow someone on Twitter, but what I'm telling you is that in life, you better be following Jesus Christ. So not only do we have to have a change in confession, and we also have to have a change in procession, but also in verse 20, we have to have a change in expression. We have to have a change in expression. And so first we have to get right with God in the upward call. Then we have to get right with ourselves and be aligned with God. That is the inward call. And then now the change in expression has, is related to others, which is the outward call. We must be aware of our engagement that we have with other people after we've gotten ourselves right with God and we've aligned ourselves with God. In verse 20, then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who had also leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So look at this. He says his profession has been changed. Peter goes from being a fisherman to a shepherd. Shepherd, So he's supposed to feed the sheep, tend the land, uh, feed the lambs, tend the sheep, and feed my sheep. And then he says, follow me. And the shepherd is supposed to guide those who follow him. And the very first person that he sees following, look at how he responds. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? So Peter just, just got, we, Peter, we just lined you up, man. We just lined you up. We just, we finally got your theology right. We finally got your anthropology right. 
and here we go. The first sheep that I bring to you, you are asking, what about him? Wait a minute, Jesus, you mean to tell me, okay, okay, I know how to fish, and you say, don't worry about fish, deal with sheep. Okay, let me wrap my head around that. Okay, so you want me to be a shepherd, and then you want to change the way I walk because you're saying that my walk is going to end with the crucifixion. But what's going to happen to this guy? What's going to happen to John? See, here's the issue where we start comparing ourselves to other people. Is that God has revealed to you your confession and your procession, and instead of you walking the walk and talking the talk, you're trying to wonder, well, why don't I have his walk? Why don't I get the same stuff that she has? And it's all a deflection. Because instead of being a reflection of Christ to the world, we want to deflect those things away and try to distract ourselves and others. And we're hoping that we can distract God from us doing what we're supposed to do. So Jesus says, okay, we still got some work to do on old Simon Peter. And so he says, in response, Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? Here's the deal. I've lined out your play. Run your route. If I am okay with John living 2,000 years or more, what difference does that make to your walk? Regardless of if he's gone in two minutes, two days, two decades, or two millennia, it makes no difference to what I have for you. And then he responds again, you, Peter, you, Simon, you, Simon, Peter, you follow me. Don't worry about other people. Don't worry about what's going on with what I'm doing and what I've appointed for them. Worry about running your race. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But you know how it goes with the, with the phone game? Whenever you tell a, a, a particular secret or something to one person, then it, it goes to another person, it goes to another person. Y'all ever played that in grade school? You know, you turn around and tell something, tell something, tell something, and it starts out that John and Susie went to the mall, and it comes out that Jesse and Sarah went to the park. We don't know how this happened, but, but John, as the author, has to put to rest some gossip that has been going around. It says, this saying went out amongst the brethren that this disciple would not die. So, so in our changing of our expression we got to make sure that we get the right impression we have to make sure that when we study the word of god for the promises of what god has for us that we don't study someone else's hearsay but we hear what he will say john has to correct this because it was said that john the apostle whom jesus loved would not die yet that was not correct Jesus did not say to them that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? What is that to you? You know, if we're going to experience that type of divine restoration, we're all going to have to go through that three-step process. We're going to have to change our confession. We're going to have to change our procession. And then we're also going to have to change our expression. And so whenever I was, I was watching this particular show that restored all these different types of cars, it was amazing to see all the work that was done. There would be an overhaul, complete overhaul of the engine and the transmission, and they'd put new paint and they'd put all these different types of, of things but the, the the way that they got those things in the first place is that there was somebody that was going out 
to find these abandoned junk cars. Someone had to go out and bring it back to the garage. It kind of reminded me of one of my favorite old shows, Sanford and Son. You see, Sanford and Son, they ran a, a salvage yard. They ran a salvage yard. They ran a junkyard. And, and the way it worked is that it was a family business. It was a father and son business. And uh, the, yes, the empire. Yes, sir, the empire. The castle that Fred built. And so amongst their home, they had all these trinkets that had been fixed up. And the way that it worked is that Fred was the father, and he stayed in the house. And he would send out his son, Lamont, out into the city to go find all these different things, things that people didn't want anymore, people that were used up, things that were used up. And he would collect these different things that that used to be a treasure but now became trash. And and he would bring those things back to the father. He would bring those things back to Fred. And Fred would go ahead and and break it down and, and fix it up and polish it up. And then he would put it on the shelf ready for use again. And I would tell you that 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 very same salvific salvage system is engaged in the trinity of the person of God the Father and and God the Son. See, what happens is God is in the house, and he sends out his son to find things that once were a treasure but now have become trash. They were used up by the world, but he goes and gets these people, these souls, and brings them back to the Father. And the Father takes a look at them and takes them apart and rebuilds them and polishes them up and restores them for rightful use. And you see, that's, that's what Jesus does for us is he goes out into the world and he brings us into the Father's house so that we can be rebuilt and restored for righteous use. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you don't know, if you haven't experienced divine restoration, then I invite you as I introduce to some and present to others, Jesus Christ, who goes out into the world and he wants to restore you. And even though there may be some things that you look at in life that are just trashed, Jesus wants to restore that part of your life into a treasure. He wants to bring you into the Father's house And here's the best part about it, is that as we saw here with Peter, even after we're saved, as believers in Christ, when we go back out into the world and we messed up and we get tarnished, we get scarred and scraped and we get get stained by the world and we get used up again, the Son will bring us right right back. And the Father will restore us yet again. And again and again. And I'm so glad that we don't serve a God of the second chance. But we serve a God, the God of another chance. And that's what we offer to you right now is an, another chance. Another chance to get it right. Maybe you hadn't gotten it right before. Maybe you denied Jesus in the presence of others. Maybe you haven't quite gotten your love to level up to Uh, Jesus' standard, but right now you have an opportunity to at least express that you admire Jesus and that you accept him. You recognize him as your Lord and as your Savior. May God bless you and keep you is my prayer. Amen. At this at this moment, at this moment in time, we do want to invite you to exercise the opportunity to be able to render unto the Lord that we can't beat God's giving, but we sure can try. We can we can 
we can know that all things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own that we have given you. Just a token of gratitude for what he's already done in our lives and what he is yet to do as well. We have several options. You have the opportunity to go to our website uh, and give online. And also we do have options that you can contact the church uh, and have a deacon come by and he can receive your offerings uh, in person. Uh, so we invite you at this time to exercise the opportunity to express thanks to God in your giving. Amen. Won't you give God a hand praise for Reverend Sean Aguilar and for sharing the word of God with us today, reminding us of the importance of divine restoration. Thank you, Brother Begin, because, you know, in this, uh, in this pandemic, if, if you're not careful, man, you will kind of get loose and kind of loosey-goosey about your relationship with Jesus Christ. So I just want to encourage everybody just to maintain your focus. We're good, Zach. We're good. Maintain your focus, maintain your trust in him, uh, maintain your, um, your level of, of loyalty to him, uh, because the reality is for all of us, we can all get a little bit all twisted, if you will, at some point. Here's, let's do this power clap for Sister Mary Leonard, Javon Simmons, Clyde Berry Jr., Julia Johnson, Mary Rubin, Andrea Baylor, and O'Shea Dunham, happy birthday to each and every one of you, in particular to uh, Sister Mary Leonard and Javon Simmons. Happy birthday to you all on today. We pray and trust that you are having uh, a great day. We're going to be transitioning shortly to our Sunday school. Guys, I'm going to ask the men, if you will, to call our old, uh, the regular free conference call line. Reverend Sean is going to be teaching Sunday school, so pray for him that the Lord preserve his voice to be able to do that. And then the latest, the new number that you have, you know how to call that number. Uh, Sister Pat Gatterson is going to be leading you uh, in teaching the, and the word of God. The other thing that we do need is right after this is done, please, parents, please, parents, please, parents, Please, parents, please, parents, engage your children in the study of the word of God. Uh, the Bible clearly says that we ought to raise them up. We're in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And the only way we can do that is spending time teaching them in the word of God. So the schedule has been laid out for us. We know what we need to do. So I'm begging you, parents, grandparents, guardians, whoever you may be, that have a, a, a authority over your children, make sure that you can also spend time with your children to do that. Listen, folks, uh, y'all want y'all to keep this in mind. Keep this in mind, what God has done. Uh, for years, we have been used to getting here at 9 o'clock. Uh, we get here at 9. Uh, we have our worship time. We transition to Sunday school. We've done all of that. And normally, it's about 12 o'clock before we really leave this place, Right? Because of the pandemic, we shortened some things down, and now we basically doing everything we're doing in two hours. Listen, we can't do it shorter than that, folk. Listen, please, listen to me. It would be, it would be a shame before God if we were to have God to give us all we need for 168 hours a week and then turn around and say, look, God, I can give you one hour. That's about it, but that's my limit Please don't do God like that. He is so much more worthy than that. So after we've heard again a word like we've heard for restoration, knowing that God continues to restore us, I want to thank God for Mike Burns and Damon Audwan for Judy, Fer Judy Ferdinand leading us in our time of music on today, uh, uh, Zacchaeus and Jamal for the things that they've done in making the video presentation today. Normally our children would be here, but we know because of the rise uh, that took place this week, uh, we just thought it best just for us to just kind of narrow our numbers down as much as we could on today. So guess what? Again, at 10, I'm going to say at, at, at about 
1022. Everybody be online for, to start Sunday school, and we're going to go to Sunday school till about 11, 11.05. No later than that, we will be done. So please, brothers and sisters, engage in Sunday school until we meet again. Father, how we love you, how we bless you, how we honor you, how we praise you, how we thank you for every song that was sung, every prayer that was prayed. We thank you for the service that we we're able to render to you today, even in our homes, wherever we may be in our cars. Thank you for bringing for some of us to the building today and allowing us to worship and praise you in a spirit of holiness and a spirit of beauty. We pray now that you would be with us as we leave this place. We pray that you would lead, guard, guide us, direct us, and protect us, and we'll be cautious and careful at every juncture of our life to give you honor, praise, and glory because it all belongs to you. For we pray it all in Christ's name and his name alone. We pray these things. Amen. Lord bless you until we meet again.